Well, thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute delight to be here this afternoon. Um, and things have moved on, you'll be pleased to know, since uh, uh, 2014. Yeah, I want to sort of flag up the revolutionary changes that have happened in this, in this area of, of, of circadian neuroscience, our fundamental understanding how sleep and circadian rhythms are both generated and regulated, but in parallel, the fundamental importance of this biology to our health and wealth. That's why I wrote Lifetime. Well, there's two things. I mean, it was really unpacking the science, but also I was so frustrated with the sergeant majors of sleep saying, you must get eight hours or you'll die, or you can't look at a Kindle or before bed, otherwise you'll disrupt your circadian rhythms, or melatonin is a sleep hormone. This is these are things are nonsense. Um, this huge variation in healthy sleep from six hours to 10, maybe even 11 hours. Melatonin is a biological marker of the dark. It is not a sleep hormone. And if you look at the data behind the publications of those articles that Kindles will destroy your sleep, it's just kind of marginal. It's barely statistical. So, so there's a lot of myth busting in the book. What I thought we could do with the 15 minutes or so that we've got is sort of provide a few slides on a brief introduction to the biology, sort of setting the stage. Then the importance of biological time. What we do when really mat matters, and I'll come back to that point several times. Then we'll, we'll move on to sleep and circadian rhythm disruption, something we've abbreviated as SCARD. What happens when we work against this fundamental deep biology? And then what we can do. And what I decided to do in this box here, what we can do, is not talk about the usual sorts of light therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, but as an example of how fundamental curiosity-driven research is giving rise to the development of new drugs. So let's kick off with a brief introduction and stating something really obvious, but I think it's worth bearing in mind, we sit on a planet that revolves once every 24 hours. And this provides huge complexity uh, for all life on Earth, essentially all life on Earth. We have the night and the day and the transformative effects of light and no light, heat, um, uh, uh, cold, availability of food and not. And of course, the biological response by almost all life is to have an adaptive sort of response, to have a period of physical inactivity, for uh, day active animals where they're physically inactive during the night, but they're physically active during the day. And of course in us, uh, these are the different states of sleep and consciousness. But as I hope to sort of illustrate, these are fundamentally different states. And as we'll see, underpinned by fundamentally different biology, but they talk to each other uh, in an incredibly important way. The point I want to make is that the body clock or the circadian system adjusts or fine tunes physiology for the complex and varied demands of the 24 hour day. It's a remarkable compartmentalization of our biology in time and that brings enormous selective advantages. So let's look at some of these changes in our biology. In each, each case here we have a 24 hour time base from 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. and we're gonna look at a range of changes, the gray, bar is roughly where night would be. And we see blood pressure here. Um, uh, it drops uh, throughout the night uh, whilst we need to deliver less nutrients and oxygen because we're not metabolizing quite so vigorously. But in anticipation of waking up and renewed activity, there's a sharp rise in blood pressure. And incidentally, there's a 50% greater chance of having a stroke or a heart attack during that 6 a.m. to 12 noon window. And that raises some important points about drug delivery. If we look at some other aspects, uh, growth hormone, almost exclusively released during the first part of the night. And of course, when we're kids, we use it to grow, but as adults, we're using it for tissue repair. Uh, temperature, that drop in core body temperature, again, slightly lower metabolic rate, but in fact, that drop in temperature has been associated with sleep initiation. If you block that subtle drop in core, in core body temperature, it's more difficult to get to sleep. Cortisol, one of the stress hormones, rising, increasing heart rate, increasing glucose release for increased metabolic activity during the day. Melatonin, as I said, a biological marker of the dark, peaking at around about four o'clock or so in the morning. And indeed our cognitive abilities, as I'll illustrate later, show a marked 24 hour change. Okay, what this illustrates is for our biology to work, we need 
the correct materials, the right stuff, at the right concentration, delivered to the correct tissues and organs at the right time of day. And the circadian system plays a key role in this spatial and temporal organization. It's embedded in every aspect of our biology. Okay, let's now illustrate those points with the importance of biological time. And let's kick off with time of day and cognition, or the processing of information. And here we see um, a time base of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And we're going to look at the impact of, of doing sort of multiplication, reaction times, problem solving, memory recall over that time frame. And we see for adults this marked and sharp rise so that by 11 a.m. to 12 noon, we have roughly our peak ability to process information. And then it declines. That's adults. And I think it's worth then illustrating this with some teenagers. Teenagers are delayed by about two hours. And if there are any teachers in the audience, this is for you. Um, traditionally, the most demanding subjects, maths and the sciences, are delivered first thing in the morning. Well, it's fine for the teachers. They are indeed at their peak. Uh, but the students uh, won't be reaching their peak until a couple of hours later. And in fact, when exams are moved to the early afternoon, exam uh, success goes up. So there's a real biological effect here between students and their teachers. Let's now extend that beyond 11 p.m. And I love these data. Uh, and they were... Um, and they illustrate the fact that at 5 a.m., you know, this is our lowest ability to process information. And I think intuitively we might feel that. But this is an experiment that was undertaken by Drew Dawson in Australia. And perhaps only an Australian could do this. Because what Drew did is look at the cognitive decline with increased alcohol consumption uh, against the cognitive decline across the time of day. And the serious point he makes is that um, you're legally drunk with a cognitive deficit of minus 15. But in fact, at 5 a.m. in the morning, uh, your cognitive de deficit is minus 20. So if you take nothing from this talk, then if you're driving a car at 5 o'clock in the morning, your ability to drive that car is worse than if you consume sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. And no surprise, accounting for traffic volume, this is the most dangerous time to be on the road. Now we're going to move to something rather chilling, and we've sort of touched on cancer already today. And this is the time of cancer treatment. And this is a literature that goes back quite some time, and I'm just going to show you one example. This is from Bill Horesky's uh, lab, and it looks at uh, the same uh, 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 chemotherapy, uh, but given at two different times, about 12 hours apart, Schedule A and Schedule B. So key point, the same concentration, the same drugs, different times. Survival after five years with Schedule A was 45% of the population that was studied versus 10% of the population. We get similar fi figures for chemotherapy in childhood leukemia, recent studies on radiotherapy, on brain cancers, and even immunotherapy uh, for cancer are all showing this important time of day effect. And this really isn't being fully integrated into our healthcare systems at the moment. Time of day and drug development. And I think this is something that is profoundly overlooked. Of course, what we do, and quite rightly, is pre-screen our drugs and do a lot of drug development in our mice, which are, of course are nocturnal, and then we extrapolate those findings to a day-active human. This is a good example of where not taking time of day into account completely distorted the initial results. So this was a drug that was being developed to uh, reduce the effects of stroke. So this is a surgical stroke in a mouse, and the researchers went in, gave the drug, and it worked superbly well. Really exciting results, really exciting results. So <clears throat> that, of course, was at the beginning of the mouse's sleep phase. So then uh, extrapolated and went to the human studies, and the clinician scientists went in, gave the drug uh, early in the beginning of the day, didn't work at all. And then the penny dropped. Ooh, maybe it's a different biological time. So they went back and thought, well, what happens if we give this drug at the beginning of the mouse wake phase? Will it work or not? 
and it didn't. So in that sense, if you compare like with like, humans and mice are the same. And so what now what's going on is they're trying this drug out at the beginning of the human sleep phase, and actually all indications are that it's actually working really well. So it's a really important point that if we're doing drug testing, we've got to do it at the right biological time. And you know, one worries that um, the number of, of chemicals, drugs, that are sitting on shelves across the world that have been tested at the wrong time, and we've lost some fantastic opportunities. So doing the right thing at the right time really matters. What about sleep and circadian rhythm disruption, or SCARD, as a result of shift work, long working days, anxiety, stress, pain, poor health, poor light exposure, you name it. Well, let's look first of all at the impact on our emotional responses. We see fluctuations in mood, irritability, anxiety, loss of empathy, frustrations, take, uh, doing stupid and unreflective things, risk-taking and impulsivity. Negative salience, really interesting. The tired brain recollects negative experiences, but it forgets the positive ones. So the worldview is entirely based upon one's negative experiences. Stimulant use, caffeine reversed by alcohol, or, and that can bleed into illegal drug use. If we think about cognitive responses, uh, ability to multitask, memory consolidation, information processing. I'm going to show you some data on that. Concentration, communication, decision making, creativity, productivity, motor performance, social connectivity, essentially all the things that make us human and functional in the workplace are profoundly impacted by sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. And if we look at physiology, daytime sleepiness, microsleeps, cardiovascular disease, altered stress responses, lowered immunity, cancer, and I'll come back to cancer, metabolic abnormalities, type 2 diabetes, depression and psychosis, an area we've done quite a bit of work, a very important relationship between sleep disruption, depression and psychosis, and there's now really clear data showing that sort of significant sleep-wake disruption during the middle years increases your risk of dementia in the later years. So briefly, information processing and cancer. Cancer this, I think, is extraordinary, and I've listed some of the citations so that you are aware of how much work has been done in this area. Nurses who work night shifts have higher rates of breast, endometrial, and colorectal cancers, and this risk increases with the time spent doing shift work. Um, and indeed, the correlations between night shift work and cancer are now considered so strong that shift work is officially classified as a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization. And while we're talking about it, actually shift work is a, is a major disruptor of reproduction as well, reproductive health. And I just want to talk about this data, uh, uh, these data on information processing. This is three groups, and they were asked to perform a cognitive task, solve a problem. One group were introduced to the task in the morning and then performed it to that afternoon, and 20% of the group got it. Second group introduced to the task in the morning, but they performed it the following afternoon, but no sleep. 20% solved the problem. Interestingly, no worse than the, um, the, the morning, same day, afternoon testing. And of course, the interesting group is introduced to the task in the morning, performed the task uh, the next afternoon with a full night of sleep, 60 to 70%. Um, solve the problem. A great illustration that sleep promotes the ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems. It's not an indulgence or a luxury. It's a fundamental part of being human, frankly. Okay, what can we do? Well, um, there's a lot we can do. This is not an all doom and gloom, gloom space. Um, and, and that's what a lot of lifetime is about. What, 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 what's, what options are available to us? Um, but what about blindness and other conditions where behavioral change or light therapy simply won't work. Let me explain what's going on. So this is um, exposure to a light-dark cycle in a normal individual, and you need exposure to a light-dark cycle to line the internal clock to the external world, as illustrated here. You're doing the same thing at the same time every day. However, if you're exposed to a very weak light-dark cycle, as in many nursing homes, or if you have no eyes, then what happens is the clock will tick, 
But in humans, the clock is slightly longer than 24 hours, so activity will get later and later and later each day. Now, and, and of course, that results in poor health and scarred. So this is the sort of pattern you'd see in a normal individual, and the, and the horizontal black bars are, are roughly when individuals were sleeping. And this is the sort of pattern that you'd see in a free-running individual with no eyes, and we're studying uh, with our Blind Veterans, uh, Blind Veterans UK charity, remarkable organization. This is some data from those, those individuals. We're back to melatonin. Melatonin is a very valuable marker of where the clock is. And you see on four subsequent weeks, the melatonin peak was at the same time, day after day. This is an individual with no eyes, and you see that the peak got later and later and later on subsequent days. Why is this important? Well, we've talked about scarred, and these people have high levels of scarred, but also the emotional impact is, remark is, is quite frightening. I'm at my wit's end, suffering from variable bedtimes and wake times. I'm slowly becoming socially isolated. Another, it feels like constant jet lag. I feel ill all the time. So what can we do? And this is the motivation for what Arti, Shri, and I um, developed circadian therapeutics. And the point is, we have been working in the space of trying to understand how light regulates the clock for some considerable time. And based upon our fundamental understanding of how light regulates the circadian system, we've developed different drugs to regulate the clock. It's a really exciting time. And I just want to show you one uh, a bit of data. Uh, the preclinical mouse work using uh, CT1500, which is a drug which acts on the same pathway as light, so it fools the clock that it's seen light. So this is our assay, so we've got a mouse in a running wheel, and you see that its activity is drifting to the left. The biological clock of a mouse is shorter than 24 hours, so it drifts in this direction. And then we're going to give the drug, and what you see is that the activity then locks on to the drug administration, take the drug away, and it drifts through time. So that's the model, and that hopefully will help you um, visualize the data in the next slide. So here's our mouse, constant darkness. Um, throughout the dotted period on the left, uh, it was given the drug, and in this case it was a, uh, a non-active form of the drug, and you see that the mouse drifts through time, just like our blind veterans. These are the exciting data. Mouse, again, in darkness, so drifting through time, and then given the drug, and you see that it locks on beautifully, take the drug away, and it drifts off. So we genuinely have fooled the clock that it's seen light. The FDA have given us orphan drug approval uh, for non-24-hour sleep-wake disorders, and we got first in human trials, showing that this is a, a, a harmless drug. Well, it, 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 there are no uh, adverse side effects of taking the drug. So I think we've nailed it. Okay, so why is this important? Well, of course, it's important for people who don't have eyes. But shift work disorder, mental illness, schizophrenia, massive sleep-wake disruption. Neurodevelopmental disorders and neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, um, uh, dementia, all have patterns that resemble this. So I think if we nail it for eye loss, we can then map it out across different health spaces. Okay, so what I'd hope to give you a sense is the importance of compartmentalization of our biology in time and, and why doing the right thing at the right time really matters, whether it be education, as we saw, whether it be in cancer treatment, or whether it be drug development. We've got to start taking this stuff seriously. Then sleep and circadian rhythm disruption, it's not just feeling tired at an inappropriate time. It has global effects upon our health. And what can we do? Well, there's a lot of behavioral change, light therapy that we can implement, but where that doesn't work, we've got the opportunity now of development of, of new drugs. And if I can I sort of end my career having given back a sense of biological time to these groups, I will be happy sitting by my wildlife pond, perhaps with a gin and tonic. Um, so thank you for your attention. <clears throat>